Chapter 11 is one of our shortest chapters in organic, and it focuses around the question, what if I want to make carbon nucleophilic? Okay. Everything we've considered in the past has had carbon acting as an electrophile because it was attached to an electron withdrawing group. Right. But now we're going to look at the flip side of that, making carbon nucleophilic so it itself can react with an electrophile. Yeah. So up top here is what we've seen in the past, right? Carbon attached to something that's more electronegative, right? an electron withdrawing group, so it gets a delta positive. It's an electrophile, will react with a nucleophile. But chapter 11 is focusing on what we have down here. Okay. Now I take my carbon and attach it to something less electronegative. That gives me a delta negative on carbon because now carbon is the thing that's more electronegative and that allows it to react with an electrophile. Okay, but the takeaway there is carbon has to be bonded to something less electronegative than itself to be nucleophilic. So if we think about the possibilities on the periodic table, right, carbon there with an electronegativity of two and a half, right, it's really only metals that we can use to bond to carbon to have them be less electronegative, right? And then have carbon be a nucleophile, hence the world of organometallics. Uh, there are a lot of metals that we can use in order to make an organometallic compound, right? Organometallic just means it has a carbon metal bond somewhere in the molecule. And you see here 10 of them on the screen. What we'll focus on in this chapter are carbon magnesium, carbon lithium, carbon copper, and carbon palladium bonds. Okay. Organomagnesium and organolithium compounds are exceptionally common in the world of organometallic compounds because they have more stable bonds than some of the others that you see on this screen. Okay. Quick nomenclature just so you're familiar with it as we move through the chapter. And if you're naming an organometallic compound, you name the alkyl group, then the metal that it's bonded to, and if there's a counter ion present, you name that last. Okay? So on the left-hand side there, it's a butyl group with lithium, butyl lithium. Okay? In number two, ethyl group with magnesium, so it's ethyl magnesium, and then the counter ion is bromide. That's called a Grignard reagent. Okay? Number three, two propyl groups, dipropyl, cadmium, and then last at the end, tetraethyl lead. So let's think about organolithiums first. Here we see some organolithium compounds. And these guys are prepared by adding lithium metal to an alkyl halide in a nonpolar solvent. Right? So you look at both of those reactions, they have lithium metal, got two equivalents. They've got an alkyl halide and a nonpolar solvent, hexane in this situation. Okay. And you can use bromine, you can use chlorine. Alkyl bromides are the most common alkyl halide to use for preparing organolithium and organomagnesium compounds because they react more readily. Okay, just FYI. But alkyl halide, lithium, nonpolar solvent, you're in business. You can prepare an organolithium. Okay. What about an organomagnesium compound? Same idea. Alkyl bromide react with magnesium shavings in a nonpolar solvent. Okay, here with these, the solvent's a little more important. Right? And you prepare an organomagnesium bromide. Okay? And those organomagnesium compounds are called Grignard reagents, named after Victor Grignard, the guy who discovered them. Okay. I mentioned solvent's a little more important here for two factors. The first one is that it has to be dry. Okay, you have to be working under anhydrous conditions. Secondly, right, that solvent can't be hexane like it was before. Okay, you saw THF and ethers used before. Okay, because our solvent has to have some lone pair electrons in order to complete the octet around magnesium. And if you recall from chapter 19 in Chem 2, right, when we're sharing electrons with a metal, that's called coordination. That's what allows this Grignard reagent to dissolve and remain in solution. Okay, so the solvent's important there. It's also important that it's dry okay, because these things are incredibly basic. Right? They'll react with anything that's slightly acidic. Even the protons on water, pKa of 15.7, that's too acidic. It'll immediately destroy your Grignard reagent. 
because these organomagnesium compounds, the Grignard reagents, and the organolithiums from before react as if they're carbanions. Okay? So they're incredibly strong nucleophiles and incredibly strong bases. Okay? Matter of fact, we think about them reacting, right? This is what they'll actually look like on an assignment, but you think about them reacting as a carbanion, right? Split that bond, give the lone pair to carbon in each situation and the negative charge. And those will react, as I said, with anything that's got an even slightly acidic proton. It's going to pull it off. If you have any acidic hydrogens anywhere, they will get consumed by an organolithium or a Grignard reagent. Okay, so when you're preparing these, thinking about your solvent, you can't have anything with any sort of acidic functional group. right? You can't have an SP, hybridized carbon. You can't have an amine. You can't have a alcohol. Okay, because those protons would be lost. Uh, so solvent must be dry, must have a lone pair if you're preparing a Grignard reagent. One useful application of these guys is to prepare deuterated hydrocarbons. And those have importance in NMR in chapter 14. Okay. Take a alkyl halide, turn it into a Grignard reagent, right? Magnesium shavings and tetrahydrofuran. Okay, then react that with D2O, that's going to be an acidic, right, heavy proton in this situation, deuterium, it's going to get consumed, and we've prepared a deuterated compound. That brings us to 11.2, transmetallation, thinking about some other reactions of these organometallics. Yep. An organometallic compound will undergo what's called a transmetallation reaction. Yep. If it at the end of the day, forms a less polar bond between the carbon and the metal. So these transmetallations, it's kind of right there in the name. Okay, they're also known as metal exchange reactions. Basically, we're just swapping one metal for another one. Okay. And you see the point down there at the bottom, right? The more polar the carbon-metal bond, the more reactive the organometallic compound. Right? So the greater polarity, the more reactive it is, okay, the more it wants to form something that's more stable. Okay, because carbon wants to preferentially bond something closer to itself in electronegativity. Okay, so I go from carbon, electronegativity is 2.5, we mentioned before, magnesium 1.2, well cadmium is a little bit closer, 1.5. So I can swap magnesium for cadmium okay, just by reacting it with cadmium chloride. That's a transmetallation reaction, but it only happens right, if at the end of the reaction you're forming a less polar carbon metal bond. Okay. Another thing to consider right, is the overall reactivity. If I'm comparing two organometallics, an organolithium and a Grignard reagent, okay, the more polar the bond, aka the greater difference in electronegativity, the more reactive that thing is. Okay. So organolithiums with a difference of one and a half are more reactive than Grignards with a difference of 1.3. More polar bond, more reactive. And we're going to keep that in transmetallations in mind when we go next and talk about a different organometallic, where we start introducing now some transition metals in 11.3, which discuss organocuprates. Okay. Organocuprates are prepared right, by taking an organolithium and introducing it to copper iodide and THF. Organocuprate, also known as a Gilman reagent, over here on the right-hand side, as named after Henry Gilman, who first did these things. And this is an example of a transmetallation reaction that happened because it's less polar. We form this organocuprate, less polar bond, less reactive than the original organolithium or an organomagnesium. But organocuprates are super useful because we can use them to do what's known as a coupling reaction, taking two alkyl groups and joining them together. A coupling reaction. And this is what a coupling reaction looks like. I take an alkyl halide, okay, you can use alkyl bromides, alkyl chlorides, alkyl iodides, you can use anything except for fluorine, right? Fluorine would not work up here. And the alkyl halide couples the alkyl group to one of the alkyl groups of the Gilman reagent. Yep. And you displace whatever your halogen was, bromine in this situation, right? 
So based, these things are incredibly easy to write the products for, and you don't have to know the mechanism because the exact mechanism isn't known, right? You just have to take the group from the alkyl halide, one of the groups from your Gilman reagent, put them together, right? New carbon bond, that's your product, lithium bromide, and the copper keeps one of the alkyl groups at the end of the day. A super simple reaction, incredible utility, right? Nice reaction to form carbon-carbon bonds. And you can do it with any alkyl halide as your starting material, right? As long as it's not a secondary or a tertiary carbon there. Okay, so it works for primary, methyl, aryl, vinylic, allylic. Any of these guys, you can do these copper coupling reactions with. Just can't be secondary or tertiary. And that's useful, right? The synthetic importance there is because you can use it to make products that traditionally can't undergo a nucleophilic attack, right? I can't attack this aryl group or this vinyl group over here. Those aren't electrophilic carbons, okay? but I can do a coupling reagent okay, to replace the halogen with whatever the group from my Gilman reagent is. Quick note about stereochem, also very simple with these organocuprates. Okay? The configuration of the double bond is retained. Okay? So we're thinking about cis or trans or E or Z with these guys and they stay the same. Okay? If it was cis, it stays cis. If it was trans, it stays trans. We just swap our halogen for whatever the alkyl group on my organocuprate was. Very simple. One other consideration with our organocuprates is the fact that they are nucleophiles, so they can react with electrophiles, which is what we see on this slide. Okay. Organocuprate acts as a nucleophile. Here I have an electrophilic carbon, right? Nothing to worry about. I'm just thinking about this, again, acting like a carbanion, one of the groups, so it's gonna come in here, attack that carbon, okay, break the bond, shift it over to oxygen, I form butoxide to start, and if I do an acid workup from there, I can form one butanol. So that sums up all the reactions of organocuprates. The rest of the chapter will talk about other transition metals, starting with palladium, but we'll introduce that in video two.